Good morning, everyone. <laughs> How was the conference so far? <laughs> um, so I'll be here talking for a little bit about um, the directions for a core. Um, it's very much meant to be a discussion. So I don't have a whole lot of slides. I do have a few slides. But uh, after the slides, I hope we can have a, a you know, a very, um, what's the right word? A very, sorry? Productive, Productive for sure. Uh, <laughs> uh, but hopefully entertaining discussion uh, about this topic. Uh, but before we start, it would be useful for me to get a sense of how many people consider themselves to be um, core developers. All right, so a good chunk. How many Drupal developers? I guess everybody, no surprise. <laughs> Um, so here we go. So the thing I wanted to talk about um, is something which we have talked about a lot <laughs> and then somehow we stopped talking about it and so now I want to talk about it again. Any guesses? No guesses? Say that again? <laughs> no. It's much more interesting. Uh, <laughs> So what I wanted to talk about is, <laughs> if we want to talk about performance, we still can. Um, but um, I would like to talk about some of the possible directions for Drupal core. Like, you know, it's a big core, small core, um, you know, packaged core, or, you know, lieutenant core model. Um, how many people are familiar with this discussion? All right, almost all people. So I'm going to... I'm going to like try and summarize kind of the, um, the different viewpoints and um, share my own viewpoint and then hopefully uh, talk about it more. So I think that what most users want, end users, um, and almost no core developers, <laughs> they want a bigger core. And so um, if you look at Drupal 6 and Drupal 7, Drupal 7 got, you know, has gotten much bigger than Drupal 6. Obviously, we added a whole bunch of stuff. And possibly, you know, in the view of these people, uh, the users, um, Drupal 8 could even be bigger than Drupal 7, right? And so some people su suggest adding things like drafts and inline editing and media and, you know, all of these new things which you're working on. So naturally, core tends to get bigger and bigger over time. Um, and that's kind of the big core uh, position. There is, you know, advantages and disadvantages to that. Um, you know, some of the pros are we have, um, you know, much better out-of-the-box functionality. So for people that just come to Drupal and they download Drupal, they can install it and all of a sudden they have something useful to work with versus something which they need to add, you know, like 20 modules on top of. Um, another advantage is more on the logistic sides of things, which is there is only one repository, there is one issue queue, you know, it's all centralized right, the way, we, the way we work on this. Um, some of the negatives are complexity of core grows. Um, you know, for some people that's considered a negative, um, especially the developers. Um, the current core developers, I, I would say, they don't necessarily like to work on some of these other things. Um, you know, they're, they're used to working on their subsystems, and if new subsystems come in, um, it's not always um, something that they're passionate about. And so, arguably, we would need to attract core developers that are passionate about these new subsystems. Uh, but, you know, these are some of the arguments that I've heard against it. On the other side, um, what a lot of the distribution authors want, and, you know, a chunk of the core developers as well is, is kind of the small core model. Um, and the reason they want this is you know, especially in Drupal 6, and in Drupal 7 it has gotten much better, but in Drupal 6 if you wanted to build a distribution and you wanted to overwrite or change some of the behavior of, of core, you needed to do a lot of work to undo the things that core did. In Drupal 7 I think that has improved a lot, and I think um, in Drupal 8 if we, if we do what we want to do with Symfony um, and the other initiatives I think it should, you know, should be easier for people to undo things. Um, and that's primarily why these people, I think, wanted to have the small core stuff. So here's another view of that where, you know, basically in this world, Drupal is pretty much a framework exposing APIs 
and then um, the different distributions, they just add contributed modules on top of a basic framework. Um, there's advantages and disadvantages to this as well. Um, we have better separation between product and framework, which is, is healthy uh, to have these abstractions and separations. We, we still have only one team, right? It's, this, it's, it's one team, one, one issue queue, one Git repository. Uh, it would be a smaller co code base. And so um, the team could be responsible for less and arguably we would be able to iterate faster on a smaller code base. Um, there's some negatives, of course, um, you know, distributions. There's a lot of distributions. I, I really believe we'll have, you know, thousands of distributions over time and hopefully hundreds of really good ones. We already have several. I think we already have like a hundred plus, if not more. Um, well, with, in this model, there is a real risk that these distribution authors would need to reinvent pieces um, or that they, you know, they don't get synergies as much as they would from um, a bigger core. Um, you know, one of the biggest problems right now in Drupal is all of the choice. Like people new to Drupal, it's like, oh, there's 10,000 modules. <laughs> all I want is build an image gallery, which, you know, how do I do this? You know, which of the modules do I use? So it's not easy for users to, um, you know, to deal with that choice. And it's often through our companies, right, the development shops that we help the help you know users make make those choices. Now, in the case of distributions, it might be slightly different because you would think end users would download the distribution. So we would need to figure out how we help users with all of that choice. Um, I think another con is if we are honest with ourselves, then you know Drupal simply doesn't compete with some of the other frameworks. We're not up there in terms of um, you know, quality. And the reason Drupal wins today is because we have this unique combination between framework and product. It's not because we have the best possible framework in the world. Um, and then, the, you know, the final point here is I'm not even sure I would like to be a framework <laughs> because in my mind, um, while frameworks are great, um, they're really useful for building bespoke websites. Um, they're really useful for building I mean, there's just fewer websites and I would like to do, I would like us to do things which matter, you know, really think big, really try and, you know, get to, you know, 15% of all the websites in the world. And I think you don't, you simply can't get there with a framework approach. You need the product slash framework approach in my mind. So there is disadvantages. Um, and then the third model is kind of the packaging model or the lieutenant model. There's probably different flavors of this as well, but it's um, a model where core Drupal is maintained by a number of maintainers, and then we pull in uh, contributed modules um, through like a make file, uh, a drush make file, or, or some other mechanism, but effectively each of those contributed modules would be maintained by their maintainers, and they would have, um, you know, obviously authority over these modules, right? And so it's like the virtual core team grows. Um, pros and cons to that as well. Um, you know, we, we, Drupal itself would be more of a distribution. I guess it would be more useful out of the box, which would be a positive for end users. Um, you know, future versions, if we apply this model, future versions of Drupal, um, they, they would ship with key contributed modules ready to go. Like we would need to align our release schedules you know, so if you release core, well, maybe views should also be ready at the same time before we can release core. Um, that obviously wouldn't be easy to do, but it would be very helpful for end users. Um, the other advantage is because more people would have authority to commit things, um, we wouldn't get blocked on core committers as much. Um, there's more people that could commit to their, their pieces of the project. Um, then the cons. Um, obviously, you know, if we have 20 more modules that we are pulling in, then there's 20 more places on d to that we would need to track. A lot of issue queues, a lot of people to deal with, uh, a lot of back and forth probably. Uh, so it definitely makes, um, you know, working together a little bit more difficult as well. Uh, it can also be an issue 
relative to security releases. Like if we would need to do a release, all of a sudden we'd need to make sure we can, um, you know, we, we can pull in all of the latest versions of these modules and make sure they're all well tested and, and secure. Um, one other disadvantage is that it becomes a little bit harder to main, maintain consistency. Um, you know, because different people have slightly different views on how things should look or work. Um, and I think one of the things we're good at in core is, you know, applying rules and making sure things are nice and clean. Like, if you think about some of the top contributed projects, historically some people have preferred much more object-oriented approach and other people not, and like, um, so we'll, we'll get more inconsistencies across uh, core Drupal, uh, most likely. Um, and I think, you know, it, it may be difficult for people that consider them, you know, generalists in core to keep up. So I think there will be more separation uh, in terms of specialties. So that's kind of, a, you know, the, the three different models, big core, small core, lieutenant core. I think that's sort of the terminology that we've been using. Um, before we jump to the, the conversation piece, um, I'd like to maybe share my vision. And my vision can change over time, and it has changed over time, but this is my current thinking. Um, so I really believe, and, and I've, I've said this in the keynote as well, that the core of Drupal should have all of the infrastructure um, that people expect in a website. And that goes from the developer experience. In my mind, we need to have all the right APIs, things like web services. I think these belong in core because they're they're going to be infrastructure in the future, things like configuration management. I think these are all great examples of things which make up the infrastructure for building, you know, pretty much every website. And so that means adding those things to core. That means a bigger core. The same thing applies in my mind for building websites. You know, the tools that site builders need, I think, again, things like date module, which so many people use, things like, uh, you know, pet auto module, which almost everybody use. I think, honestly, they probably belong in core. Um, and, you know, lastly, I think it also applies to content authors or, you know, usability in general. Like, people really, as I talked about in my keynote, people really have come to expect things like inline editing, WYSIWYG, you know, all of these things. They're, they're infrastructure nowadays. Maybe not 10 years ago. Um, Remember when we hated JavaScript <laughs> and when we hated WYSIWYG? I think we, we still have some of that stuff going on and you know, maybe it's time to let go. Um, what doesn't belong in core are all the things which you know, only a small portion of all the websites need um, or the things which are very specific to let's say you know, particular industries. Um, that are not, you know, general tools and features. So, um, I think the way to get there is to, is to, you know, possibly go with some sort of hybrid model where we do need to add more stuff to core, but then, you know, for certain things which, you know, we may want to use the lieutenant model and pull in uh, some of the bigger modules instead of putting them in core. So things like views and media module, I think, may be good examples of things which we want to leave outside of the core, but at the same time, things like, you know, date module and, you know, some of the smaller modules, I guess. Um, maybe over time, they should become part of core so we get the advantages. So I think, I guess what I'm trying to say is I think we can carefully craft um, a model where we can look at the pros and the cons and try to get as many of the, the positives and try to eliminate as many of the negatives. I don't think there's a single rule which we can apply, but I think we can look at these things on a on a case by case basis. Uh, moreover, um, very recently, um, and this is huge actually, you know, we did make some changes to, you know, the way distributions can be built on DDO. We can actually now build distributions on DDO. <laughs> um, and so that actually en enables us to to try and do the packaging thing. And so, um, you know, one of the things I would like to, to try and do is, is, and I've created a project base, page for this, it's called Phoenix, and I would really like an experiment with this model a little bit in Drupal 7. Um, and so uh, my goal is to, 
you know, maintain a distribution of Drupal called Phoenix uh, and to pull in some of the best uh, authoring experience tools. So it's kind of, in my mind, it's kind of like a, a press flow for usability. Um, and just to learn, you know, learn how to use these uh, Drush make files and all of these things. Um, with the goal, though, to kind of like build a prototype of what Drupal 8 could look like in terms of authoring experience. Um, so we have a, a functional working um, prototype, and then hopefully, and hence the name Phoenix, we can figure out a way to move some of these things uh, into Drupal 8 core as well. So let's build it for seven, then move it into Drupal 8 core. So, um, so I wanna try and apply that vision um, to a Drupal 7 distribution to see how it works and how well it would work. So that's basically my little overview. Uh, I think we have about 40 minutes left or you know, 30 minutes left, so we have a lot of time for discussion. I think it's worthy a discussion. Uh, as I said in the beginning, it's something that we talked a lot about in the, the last three, you know, two to three years, if not longer. And I felt it's been like uh, sleeping, what's the, uh, you know, what's the expression? It's been like sleeping for a while. <laughs> Uh, and so I, I don't feel like we've ever resolved this thing, and I feel it would be good to try and get to closure on this and figure out a strategy. I don't expect us to figure that out today, <laughs> but I do think we should um, continue to have the debate because it's kind of these things which keep lingering around forever. So with that, I would like to invite everybody to, you know, to ask questions and to take the, you have to come to the mic because they're, they're recording the session and they're gonna share the session, so. Woohoo! Right, Therese, uh, I wanna thank you for inadvertently bringing up the chief problem with the small core discussion, mm -hmm. <clears throat> which is that it means two different things and people keep confusing them, and I think without realizing it, you've done that here as well, which is there's the question of how much functionality lives in core, how many lines of code are in core, how many modules are in, are in core, and by in core, I mean in the drupal.tar.gz file that you download. Separate from that is the question of architecturally how dependent are those modules in core. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> you know, every module that ships with core that you cannot disable is architecturally a liability. The fact that it ships in that tarball is completely separate from the fact that core doesn't work without it. And you know, one of the reasons why I never got into the small core debates when that was still uh, raging was <clears throat> people kept confusing that and anytime someone said small core, someone would say, oh, so rip out modules and it's a completely separate question. Mm -hmm. I absolutely ag agree that we need to have better separation between framework-y type functionality and application type functionality. Um, you know, your, your previous slide, you had some modules that were in the core part of the block diagram and some that were not. The fact that those modules are in core at the architect architectural and code level need to be completely incidental. Right. At that point, which ones we ship in the default distribution that happens to be drupal.tar.gz is a completely separate question and should be answered separately. And I think we need to be careful to treat those as separate questions okay. because we confused them for three years and that's why nothing ever happened with it. Yeah, good point. And that was Larry, by the way, for the recording. Yeah, maybe mention your name, um, so if people listen to the recording, they, they know we was talking. Hi, um, I'm Evan. I, Larry actually kind of hit on what I was going to say, that um, for me, I don't think that the small core versus large core thing, I don't think that those two things are mutually exclusive. As a developer, what I really care about isn't how much stuff is in core when I download it, it's how much stuff gets loaded on every request. Sorry, and how much stuff get loaded? Yeah, how much okay. stuff gets actually loaded on every request. So I don't care if core has a whole lot of things. If, if core is configurable enough that I can either remove those things completely or just disable them, or if, if you know, Bootstrap has been, I guess, reorganized enough, which the, you know, the Whiskey Initiative and the CMI Initiative are both going a pretty good ways to making that possible, if those things that are enabled just only get loaded on the requests where they're needed, Eh, I don't really care so much anymore. Right. So that's so we're talking about performance after all. Yeah. <laughs> but you're right, though. But it's not. I mean, like most bigger Drupal sites have like a hundred modules installed, right? Um, so I'm not sure. 
I mean, I, I think it's a, it's a great point, but it, it also feels like a separate discussion, I would, I would say. Hi, I'm Kerry Gordon, and Larry, of course, uh, pretty much hit on everything, almost everything I have to say. Uh, but I just want to spend that a bit. A couple things. I believe that you're actually almost on both sides of this issue in terms of what's in the tire ball and what isn't. I mean, I, that, that was the essence of my question. Is why, does all, why do all these things have to be in the tire ball uh, when we have so many great mechanisms for, for bringing them in on demand? I mean, uh, I, I'm assuming that everyone who loads Drupal is on the internet. So, uh, so I sort of feel that so, way. Also, I think that we really get caught up a lot in semantics. We use things like framework as a shortcut or shorthand for a lot of other things. And I think mm -hmm. we really have to be mindful of that because it's a slippery slope. I mean, we're not going to be symphony. We, we right. don't want to be symphony. All right. All right. Fair point. Was there a question in that? No. Just a comment, right? <laughs> uh, you don't have to have a question. But it's good to share your viewpoint. I wasn't sure if there was a question for me. Um, <laughs> So this was this so is, much this in is the chicks. air. Oh yeah, so I'm C H X in case. So uh, this was so much in the air that I actually uh, have submitted my opinion on this as a core issue yesterday. Uh, Excellent. Can you, you can you open uh, Drupal org node one four nine two nine one six for me on the projector? Um, hold on. <laughs> Could you say that number again? Because 149. 149. 2916. 2916? Yep. Oh. Well, let's Scroll see down just a little bit. We're getting there. Yep. This one? Yep. Scroll down a little. <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> awesome. So, what's in here? And all is that all? <laughs> uh, all right. I think it's a great idea. <laughs> Well, it's a sign to me, even. <laughs> <laughs> Was this after midnight or before? <laughs> Amazingly, it was at 5 p.m. All right, very funny. <laughs> Anything else you wanted to add? No? <laughs> All right. Yeah. Um, uh, this is John Allen Wilkins, I'm the Drupal 8 Mobile Initiative Lead, and uh, I missed a bunch of the, the intro to this because I was talking to Luke Rubuski and trying to pick his brain as long as, as possible while he was here. Um, the question that I asked him was, um, you know, given the importance of mobile um, and as far as there are going to be more mobile users and desktop users in just a couple of years, mm -hmm. um, and, and also given that uh, Drupal 8 is going to be released sometime next year, fingers crossed, and uh, Drupal 9 would be a good like 2016 away. Um, I asked him what are the important features that a CMS should have, uh, which stymied him a little bit because he hadn't thought about it. But the first two things out of his mouth before he sort of punted is that asked me later uh, were flexible rendering and optimizations, uh, which uh, I, I optimization meaning um, uh, front end performance, uh, all the assets and stuff. In, mm -hmm. in addition, in addition, uh, HTML, HTML optimization. Um, could you uh, sort of talk about what you think are the super critical things that as a community we should all work together? Because I'm, there's all these initiatives that are, are out there, but it's not like there are assigned people to do all that work already. Right. Um, let's see. So a couple of things. Um, you know, the initiatives are, what's the right word? The initiatives are like strategic initiatives things that we need to work on. And what the initiatives, that the initiative structure provides in my mind is, um, 
you know, some visibility for the outside world to, you know, what we're focused on, you know, what some of the big new things will be in the next version of Drupal. And we assigned an initiative lead um, to, you know, to delegate, you know, leadership and authority uh, in a way, right? Um, at the same time, it's, you know, two things. It's not the initiative lead doing all the work. The initiative lead is a leader uh, that rallies a lot of other people. I think that's one common misunderstanding. Um, you know, when they see your picture, John, up on the, on the screen and on the keynote, sometimes people say, oh, you know, John is, is taking care of all the work, <laughs> which is not the case. <laughs> and it, it shouldn't be the case, right? And so people should get involved with these initiatives. Um, at the same time, a second point would be um, there's a lot of other things which are not official initiatives, and we need to work on these things as well, right? Um, I, I could make a performance initiative, I could make um, some of these other initiatives, but I don't think we, we have to because um, I think we all know and understand they're important, and I think we, well, we work on them. And well, I, I would like to point out that the front end performance, actually, I you know, when I was talking about the Drupal 8 mobile initiative and what it should include, I absolutely wanted that inside the initiative scope right. because of so, how important I felt it was. And I also know that flexible rendering is uh, part of the web services and the blocks everywhere initiatives. So uh, I was sub somewhat slightly validated by his, by his uh, Luke's response, um, but uh, I'm hoping that, that everyone here recognizes that um, those, those are the couple things that, that Luke thought were really important for a CMS, and uh, I would love for everybody to help build those features that are part of initiatives. Right, I, and you know, I could see front-end performance being an initiative because it's, it's bigger. It's a good chunk of work that involves many different things, right? And I think it also, it also communicates a focus, right? So I think you know, it's worth, worthy to talk about that. So, All right, Peter? Hey, this is Peter Willanen. Um Three questions. So to me, your last lieutenant model essentially is small core plus a default distribution. Is there really technically any difference? Is there, is there a, a technical di difference between what you call the lieutenant model and really just saying we're having small core and we're having a default distribution? Um, so it's a good question depending on what definition you apply. Um, you know, I think I don't know if that answers your question, but I think what I want like to do, and I, this is why it's very much a discussion because I haven't finalized my thinking, is I think there's a, a timing element here as well. Like, you know, what do we want to do in Drupal 8 and what do we want to do in Drupal 9? Um, I think Drupal 8, we're already doing so much right now hmm. with these initiatives, and you know, I'd like to launch a few more initiatives, as I mentioned, um, which really means adding more to core. Um, the lieutenant model, I think, is interesting, but I, you know, I'm not overly excited to implement that right away, um, given, again, all the stuff we're already doing. So in my mind, maybe that's more of a thing which is on the table for us to talk about and to start planning, but um, maybe we don't implement that until you know, after Drupal 8 or until you know, Drupal 8 is pretty close. You know, I don't know what the exact timing is, but I don't wanna like, you know, change things midway of, of a development cycle necessarily. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, it doesn't necessarily address your question, I think. Um, but I did want to give that perspective, um, especially because I don't necessarily have the answer to your question. Okay. Uh, different topic. Uh, in terms of the initiative leads, um, have you thought about reframing those? Because I feel like there's a real problem in terminology and in, you know, person power that the I mean, you know, the initiative lead should really be called something like, you know, technical architects or something, and they need right. a project manager, you know, speaking for myself, I wouldn't even take on the role that you're offering right now as, pro as a, you know, initiative lead because I'm not great at rounding up people and managing right. their work and getting them to contribute patches. And I feel like, you know, you, we've, currently we've put those two responsibilities all on a single person and, and those people aren't, right. should really yeah. have a, like a project mm -hmm. manager that works with them and they sh it should be really clear that they're not supposed to be necessarily writing the code. And right. um, so I hope, you know, I'd encourage you to look at sort of changing the framing of this and recruiting sort of project managers for those initiatives. Right, I think it's a good point. I think um, we've, we've discussed the terminology. Um, 
in the past, and maybe there's better words to describe what they are so that people have better expectations of what they're doing. Um, at the same time, I, I can also see us, instead of having one initiative you know, lead, um, having a, a, you know, like a small team of you know, two or three people that head up the initiative, um, where one could provide the technical leadership, one could provide uh, the project management or the coordination, um, and you know, in some cases, maybe a third person would head up the usability piece of the initiative. So mm -hmm. um, I think evolving our, our thoughts and the way we approach these things, based on what we've learned, is a, is a very good idea. Mm -hmm. so. And a last quick question. Uh, I've seen inline editing as an emphasis a couple times from you, and I was just wondering where that came from, because I, I don't remember hearing about it or hearing any finding that that was something that Drupal was really right. lacking. So inline editing is kind of a, a, a bigger word for um, improving the, the authoring experience, partly through inline editing, but also more drag and drop, like the ability to drag elements on the page. So it, it's really much more, I mean, that in my mind is all inline editing. Where it came from is, is frankly, um, you know, looking at competitors, they all have it. And um, if you look at when Drupal loses against, you know, other CMSs, it, that's often a reason why, because we don't have it. And we don't even have it as contributed modules. Right, I guess I've heard that about more about layouts and actually heard the opposite, that people are frustrated by our competitors where they're forced to edit like the text in line. You know, so they, they want a you know, sort of coherent full page to author, but you know, they want sort of right. drag and drop for layouts. So I'm... Well, yeah, I can't really comment on that specific example, but... Morning, Dries. Hi. What's your name? Uh, my name's Mike Wacker, and okay. I had a question about the 99% uh, more specifically than that, 99% we never hear back. Obviously, we kind of have module usage, usage statistics which kind of give us an idea of which modules might be in core and which might be in contrib. Is there any way we can kind of enhance that data collection? Like maybe we know what the average number of roles the site uses, or maybe if like a core module can be split into like several parts, we kind of measure which parts are being used, which parts aren't being used. So that when we have these discussions, instead of just it being a grand philosophical discussion from the one uh -huh. person in here, we kind of have more data from the 99% which we can use to drive our decision making. Right, I think it's a great idea, um, frankly. <laughs> I'm a bit of a data geek myself. <laughs> and I think we have a lot of data. I don't think we really use the data well right now. I mean, we do some stuff with the data, but we could do much more like, you know, statistical analysis to see what modules are being used together. I mean, we could, through just statistics, we could almost automatically define distributions based on actual, you know, usage patterns of modules. So that's one thing. And the other thing is what you said, like getting more data uh, to DDO would be helpful, you know, on a, on a much smaller level. So, but it, I think, you know, it, as always, it takes somebody to, to step up and, and sort of rally the troops um, and, you know, to work on it. So, but I, I, I would, I mean, I think the Drupal community in general is very, very data driven. Like whenever we have data, we tend to make decisions faster. I mean, much faster because we don't need to build consensus because we just have the data. Um, so anything along those lines is really super helpful. So. Thank you. Um, I'm Jess, XJM, and my question is, so the, the problem with the lieutenant model, model for core generalists, I think there's kind of, there's two things that could be problematic. One is just in terms of the sheer number of lines of code and the question of consistency across the different, like, lieutenants domains. Mm -hmm. But then the other question is how much of it is just our tools and our workflow now? How much of that is just focused around the core queue? And could we, how much could we do to make that mod that model possible using the tools that we don't have yet. If that makes sense. Right. Well, do you have suggestions? <laughs> no, I, I'm asking it, this it, question. Yeah, it's like, I know it's a good question. Um, I, don't, I don't necessarily have the answers, but that's, I mean, these are the questions I think when I say I'm not ready to implement this right now, it, these are the kind of questions I think we need to sort through, right? We need to have a good idea of what we want to do and how we want to change things. and like. There's a, another element is it's much more political. I think there's a real risk to get um, you know, a lot more political as well, which is something that I don't like. I, you know, I wouldn't like to work in a highly political environment. But you know, imagine we pull in a module, the maintainer goes, you know, 
missing in action or whatever, what do we do? Like, you know, do I fire <laughs> that person? I mean, I'm, I, I mean, it's very, some of these dynamics are very hard. Um, so there's a social aspects in addition to just the tools. And I think what you were getting to is, you know, some of the social aspects maybe we can solve through technical solutions. Um, but there will be a lot of social things left. <laughs> Angie? Hey, um, I'm Angela Byron, or WebChick on Drupal.org, and I just wanted to touch on a few different things that have come up. I mean, I guess the first thing is, it'd be cool if we could try to stay on topic a little bit, like, and, because I know the semantics are important of this debate, but I think a lot more important is that, like, we're at a crossroads right now, it feels like it, where, um, you know, core evolves too slowly to be useful to people, and so we depend on all these contributed projects. But then if you take someone new to Drupal and you say, oh, Drupal's great because there's 16,000 modules. You just have to pick the three of them that don't suck. Yay. I mean, yeah. it's not, that actually is terrible. I mean, it's, it makes Drupal extremely hard to use. It makes it, it, it you know, it, it really hurts us, especially when, you know, you look at the trends of, you know, the, the content editors or the victims of Drupal are starting to have a much larger voice than the IT departments and what, you know, things get chosen. And even if you get out of companies Hobbyists do the same thing. They download WordPress, they download Drupal, and they download whatever, and they try them all, and they say, that one does what I want in five seconds, I'm gonna use that one. So we have a real problem with getting new people into the community because of this issue. Um, so the thing that's interesting about the lieutenant model is that uh, what I hear, I mean, I'm on the ground with all of these folks uh, who work on core, and you know, what I hear a lot of frustration around is I hear a lot of frustration about bike sheds. I hear a lot of awesome code. It's, it's it can be soul-sucking, especially if you're working on something that it feels like no one else cares about, either because they can't find the thing you're working on or because you don't have a process for you know, coming to core office hours and talking about it or that kind of thing. So it's an interesting direction for us to think about, but I agree that the social impacts of that are really important because right now we have one team that has a really wide spread in terms of you know, what we do. We have accessibility expertise, we have usability expertise, documentation, translation, core developers, all these different subsystem maintainers, and there's a lot of crossover that happens there, and I think that's what makes Drupal so strong. And so, you know, d deciding where that line falls of where, you know, we do put WYSIWYG in core, actually, um, but we don't put views in core, maybe. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I think discussing those kinds of nuances are really important. And then two other things um, is, uh, someone suggested PMs for Drupal 8 initiative leads. We actually have done that. Um, and we should give a shout out to Melissa Anderson, Shannon Vetz, and uh, Chris Strahl. Um, and they have spent a great deal of time working with the initiatives, trying to combat some of these issues, like how do I get people into my issues? How do I you know, evangelize what I'm doing? How do I make it clear to them that you know, I'm not the only person working on this? Mm -hmm. And we're still figuring this out, right? Initiatives were brand new last year. We're still figuring all the processes, but I just want to make clear that it is a larger team that's helping to support them. Um, and I think that's everything. Um, oh, and if you're interested in Drupal.org improvements, uh, you can come to my talk uh, later this afternoon. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> well said. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Frank Carey. Uh, I mean, one of the concerns for me, and I, I think maybe others, is the the release cycle time for Core. Um, I think we're bringing, we're trying to bring it down, um, but it'd be interesting if we could bring it down even further. Um, things are, with mobile going on, things are moving even more quickly than they were a few years ago. Uh, so for me, that's one of the major concerns. I'm wondering, you know, in the new model, is that a priority of trying to get that down, or is it kind of 18 months that's been put out there? Feel right. like a good so it, it's a real worry of me as well. <laughs> um, and I, I agree, I would like to figure out ways to reduce the release cycle time as well. Um, so a couple of things. Uh, first of all, we've loosened up some of the rules in terms of the backport policy. What that gives us is that we can do a little bit more innovation within a stable branch. That, I mean, that's a small win, but obviously doesn't address the fundamental issue. I think, I think this is a, a big topic, and I think it's something that, where I would be open to make bigger changes, probably not in eight, because we've already, I mean, we've already developed on eight for a year. <laughs> so it's kind of hard to make changes now, but you know, say in Drupal nine, um, 
you know, we, we could try, just like we experiment with initiatives, we could experiment with a different strategy around backwards compatibility, for example. And I don't have the answers, by the way. I'm just, I'm just saying, like, I would be open to have that conversation, and I would be willing to, to make a decision there. Um, and, you know, one possible model would be, um, I think it's uh, Ubuntu, or sorry, it's um, uh, Python. So what they do is they maintain backwards compatibility for one release, right? And so it gives us, I'm not saying that's the right approach, but it's just something for us to think about. What that gives us is some backwards compatibility. So if you install Drupal 9, all of the Drupal 8 modules would still work. Drupal 7 modules wouldn't work. Mm -hmm. um, and then that gives module maintainers one full release cycle to upgrade to the new APIs, because then the old APIs will be deprecated. Mm -hmm. um, it puts a lot more work on the core developers again, so that's that's the real, uh, I mean, that's a downside, and it's a big one, because, <laughs> you know, they're already super busy, mm -hmm. um, and they don't necessarily want to take on that work. I, I mean, they can't, but imagine a world where we would be able to maintain backwards compatibility for one release cycle. We may be able to, to shorten the release cycle length as well, uh, and because, and we would be able to because we wouldn't break all of the contributed modules every six months <laughs> or every year. So I think there is, you know, it, it's always going to be a give and take, <laughs> mm -hmm. but I think there may be experiments which we could do. And again, I don't think we can do them right now because, you know, we can't go and say we're going to maintain backwards compatibility because then we would need to go back in history <laughs> right. and, you know, write this huge compatibility layer for all of the changes we've already made. Mm -hmm. um, which is going to be impossible at this point. But again, big conversation. I think we need to have that conversation. And I think we, you know, maybe we keep everything as it is. Maybe we don't. Um, but it is a big fear of mine because I think our ability to innovate um, is critical and shortening the release cycle will allow us to go faster because people will be more, incent you know, have more incentive to contribute because um, they don't need to, like, you know, wait two years or they can actually use their own contributions. So I think there's real reasons to do it. The, the hard part is the implementation. <laughs> right. So. I mean, would a model more, I guess like you brought up Ubuntu, you know, where you kind of have a Linux kernel and um, additional pieces on top of that. Like, right. in my mind, you'd have almost like a core core, right? And it, one, it's less to work on. Um, it, you can iterate on it faster. And we already have this kind of model where Drupal, a major Drupal version gets done, then contrib picks up at that point effectively, or maybe so soon towards the end of it. Mm -hmm. um, but like for feature, feature freeze was what, December? Um, so it seems to like, if all of the focus, even for like usability and stuff like that, if, if, or before we get to usability, it's like focusing on the core bits, like we're doing with Whiskey and such, early on in the life cycle. Mm -hmm. Call that complete at some point, and then work on the more product-y pieces right. as like a separate you know, separate phase even. Right, yeah, it's a, it's a good point. All right, so we have 15 minutes left. So I'm gonna limit you guys to one question a person because there's people in line for like 30 minutes. Is that okay? That's, that, that's fine, I'm, I'm right. uh, Andrew uh, <laughs> Druish. Um, I guess I wanted to kind of sparkle that I think this really is a, it's a social problem. Um, it's the, I, I don't really think it's relevant how much code we download. The problem is who maintains it. And speaking as someone that worked really hard to get a couple of modules pushed into core so I could never ever look at them again and then totally abandon core, um, I'm guilty of that. But, I, and I think a lot of people, it's like you kind of work on something and you're really sort of passionate about it and you want to get it into core right. because you want everyone to use it and then you're so burned out by the time that happens that, you know, it's kind of like, let's see on the other right. side. Um, and, and so I think, I think that's kind of the, the aspect is then now that's foisted on everyone else and then they're responsible for it. And I think it's, that's the important part of the discussion more than what code is downloaded and executed by PHP right. because it's easier to get a faster computer, it's harder to get a bigger development community. I agree, um, yeah, very well said. I think as we get bigger, by nature we'll get slower <laughs> in terms of how we work together, so we need to re keep, keep making changes to the way we work. Um, it, some, often it's too painful to get something in core, um, sometimes for the right reasons, Sometimes it just, because we kept adding rules and rules and rules. And sometimes I feel like we have way too many small little rules. Like sometimes I feel we're 
way too strict when it comes to coding conventions, for example. Like um, other things which we could do is, is um, like sometimes issues get sidetracked by coding conventions all the way in the beginning. So, you know, one idea would be to have like architectural discussions first and then, you know, get sign up on the architecture and then only then allow people to comment on the smaller bits and pieces. Um, so, and these are things which we could enable by making some changes to project module. So, but you know, streamlining the way we work, trying to put more focus on the right process, I guess, um, will help to some extent. So part of the social problems, I think we can engineer solutions for. <laughs> but obviously not all of them. All right. All right. Um, James Gelland, I'm Nick Lindell on Drupal.org. Um, actually, a lot of what I said was the discussion that just came out, but I'll add to it a little bit. But also, uh, on top of Angie's talk, right before that from one to two, Sam's having a boff discussing Git workflows and what we can do with Git and how that can, so it's kind of similar to her talk and it's in the boff area. So if you're interested in that, that's another thing. Um, so a long time ago, Drupal 5, I kind of decided I was going to help with core and you know, did some patches, and it totally burned me out. And I walked away from it until just now recently. And what brought me back is that we have actually already moved to somewhat of a lieutenant mm -hmm. model. We've, we have initiative leads who are right. lieutenants. So we're already kind of moving that direction. We're just figuring out where we are and how to do that. And I think it's been really huge to have that because it's allowed me to be, become part of that architectural process of designing things and help with the patch, but also a big problem with, and this came up in, I, I can't remember which core conversation it was, but somebody mentioned that if they wanted to change comment module, they couldn't just make a patch and put it out there and have it happen. You have to get some, you have to get a group behind you to get some sort of momentum to get that patch through the whole process of the issue queue because it is daunting. Mm -hmm. And when in the initiative you have that group, you have somebody, a, a group that you can build consensus with and when you get to the issue queue, you have something that you can discuss and people that are there with you working on that. And that's been really huge, at least for me, um, and I think that's something we can learn from. So. Great, yeah, thank you. So I'm Chris Vanderwater, um, Eclipse GC. I'm the Blocks and Layouts Everywhere initiative owner. Uh, I, like John, walked in a, a little late and what I got was let's build an install profile where we can play with user interface stuff to see where core might should go. Um, do you have some notion of where you'd like to start? Like is there maybe an existing um, install profile that you'd like to maybe just steal and start working from? Uh, not yet. I mean, I need to do some research, but um, I would like to, for Phoenix, right? Or? Just in general. Just in general. Um, no, not really. Okay. I mean, oh, it's something that I, I want to, you know. So it's ridiculously new, but Panoply has been also really impressive. Right. Um, and given kind of where Drupal 8's going, it might be a good place to at least look at. Um, and then I'll just, I'll make one comment about initiative owners and, and walk away here. But I've been telling everybody that I work with, you know, don't worry about what is going to happen once we hit the issue queue, it's my job to take care of that. That's why I'm the initiative owner. You know, mm -hmm. just work hard on this stuff and I'll go to bat for you. And I think like, that's really, I think that's the message that we want to be sending as initiative owners. Like, we all know that there's going to be some architecture debate and there are going to be some bike sheds and things like that. But really, like, when I accepted the position of initiative owner, it was, it was I'm willing to take those things on in order to have people come behind me and, you know, really build awesome stuff and go to bat for that awesome stuff. So I think, like, yeah, as much as initiative owners need project managers and as much as initiative owners need people coming in and helping them work, you know, we might be able to garner an awful lot of support by saying, you don't need to worry about the core process for getting this in. That's my job. Just mm -hmm. get on board and help me build it. And I think right. we could all probably benefit from that, so. Oh, great comments. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, Shartan Mannes or NetTrack. 
Uh, just to get back to the small core, big core debate, I'd rather just have a smarter core, because mm -hmm. uh, right now I needed to use a feed parser for something, and then I have to load all of aggregator module, and it adds a bunch of stuff I don't want. I just want that feed parser. So what I want to see for core is to separate the APIs and the, the actual backend stuff from mm -hmm. the front end stuff better, so that you have that division, and then I can take the feed parser, so I can add my own sort of front end to that and work on that, same for like poll module and all these other sort of controversial modules in core. Because they have useful bits. Right. It's just you don't necessarily want the whole package when you just want that one little component. Right. And I think that's where we're headed with Symfony and the, the auto loaders and stuff. But I just, you know, that's what I want from core. So, Excellent. Cool. So, by the way, I need to do this. <laughs> How many people know uh, uh, Xertan? Uh, very few people. But what you should know is that he offered the, um, the, sh the shared hosting server on which I ran you know, drop.org and drupal.org. And he's also user two on D.O. And he's been gone for a while. <laughs> but what I just heard is that he's, all, he's back. <laughs> also, he was, a core com he was also a core uh, committer, so I suppose if you know. Yay. Right. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm Neil Hastings, an indie tech cook on um, drupal.org. Um, I'm pretty active in the contrib space, but um, I've trying, been trying to get into core development for a while, and every, everyone knows the barriers in there. What Chris said earlier, that's awesome. Um, not, having, not someone like me having to worry about that entire um, political process about getting a major change in. Um, feeling like I can actually make a difference instead of feeling like I have to spend hours at night away from my family fighting in an issues queue. Um, that's different when I was originally coming up here to talk about. I did have ideas around making the kind of um, more efficiency around the core process as far as the submodules, um, the sub uh, systems are, are concerned. When, when we, as we're starting to decouple these systems in aid, which is, which is working great, we can start moving these to um, sub repositories in Git and have the initiative owners or the subsystem owners have commit access to there so we're not held up on two or three people on one project. It's actually a pretty common model. Um, many open source projects use something like that. I mean, we know Symfony uses the, the whole um, Git components. Um, so I'm wondering your thoughts on that and I wanted two questions so I'm going to do a sub question. Uh, with the rumors of GitHub offering Drupal free hosting, I'm wondering why we turn that down. That's the two. Okay. Thank you. All right, so I didn't know about the rumors. Um, <laughs> so the first question was about giving um, more commit access, right? Yes. So I, you know, in my mind, it's never really been about the commit access. Um, you know, I'm, I'm happy to pull in bigger patches, bigger changes, uh, but I still think it's valuable that there is relatively few people that can act as the gatekeepers. Uh, for the code, but at the same time, like not everything needs to get to me as a micro patch. Like I would be happy, you know, Greg is at the mic, but I would be happy to to pull like you know a 300k patch from Greg, and the commit only takes you know 30 seconds. <laughs> so you know, uh, and uh, the GitHub thing, you know, I'll, I'm gonna I'm gonna table that. Uh, that question, if that's okay. I don't know the details there, uh, but I'm sure some other people do. I'm Greg Dunlap. I'm a hay rocker on the uh, internet. Um, so I, you know, a lot of these talks, you know, especially as core grows and a lot of the frustrations that I hear from people that have been here and in discussions, like Randy Fay did one on governance yesterday that was uh, touched on a lot of these issues, are really about how we scale as a community mm -hmm. as Drupal gets bigger. And, you know, a lot of our frustrations that I see in the core community, like things like I don't want to maintain features that I don't use, are really about the fact that we don't have enough core people to maintain them. But if we grow the number of core people mm -hmm. to a point where we have, you know, 2,000, 3,000 core people, that, that introduces its own set of problems too. And, you know, that's part of the problem with bike sheds right now is that we have so many people with disparate interests that talk about things. And so I'm just sort of wondering what your thoughts are about 
not necessarily, well, maybe from a technical or a social aspect, from how we, how we, uh, how we scale the community to grow to 5,000, 10,000 developers. Uh, you know, the initiative leads were obviously part of that, because I always viewed us as just being basically project managers. Right. But uh, more, if you're interested, if you've talked about more formalized structure, I mean, the commit access is part of that too. Any, any, any ideas or thoughts that you're thinking yeah. about exploring about that right now? Yeah, so I think we, we do need to scale the core team. I really do. Um, you know, I, I think what's happening, um, if you look at comparable projects, as they get bigger, as we get bigger, I think we are formalizing more things. Yeah. We're institutionalizing the way we work. Um, in most other open source projects, that also meant more people, because the complexity increases at the same time. And that's the challenge, right? So you need more people that can work in a more complex environment, <laughs> right? which is kind of at odds with each other. It's just like a growing company, really, in it a is. lot of ways. Yeah, so you need to put in place more processes, more structure, um, but ultimately what happens in, or what happened in other open source projects is there's also people that started to work full time yeah. on just core because the complexity um, became too much for you know, casual hobbyists um, to get involved in. And so if you look at Linux, for example, you know, the kernel is pretty much maintained by people that are paid by, you know, various organizations, IBM, Red Hat, and others to, to build, um, you know, to develop the core of the, the Linux kernel. And so if we are, if we want to scale Drupal by a factor of 10, I think what we, we, what we do need to do is we need to encourage the Drupal shops, you know, all of them or many of them to put people to work on core full time. And we need to encourage them to do so because it's the only, I think, truly scalable way. Um, it's the only approach which, in the long term, I'm not talking about you know tomorrow, but I'm talking about a world you know five to ten years from now where you know the world is much more complex. Um, it's the only way to keep up with the uh, the pace of the web. You know we need we need to move faster. So. Have you looked at like sort of the opposite model is more like the Mozilla Foundation where they've got that nonprofit that funds the development? Have you, talk, have you ever thought about taking the DA in that direction or? I have actually. Um, and I, I think there's ways to, and I'm, I'm working on an initiative to try and get the larger end users of Drupal to put money into a pool, if you will, and sort of some sort of funds which we can then use to fix, you know, important issues in, in Drupal core. Uh, so whether that will work or not, uh, it's, and I'll, I'll, I'll be- If I'll any be, of you, if any of you big corporations are in this room, go talk yeah. to Therese after this. It, it's code name. Thanks a lot. It's co co I mean, I'll be talking about this more, but uh, the code name is uh, large scale Drupal, which, uh, you know, which is summarized as LSD. <laughs> <laughs> um, Hi, I'm Shannon Vitas, S. Vitas on the intertubes. Um, I just had a question about Phoenix. I hope I'm not getting too off topic, and if I am, then table it. But I was just wondering who's working on that, and where can we read some more about it? Right, so, it, you know, it's, nobody's working on it right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I hope to, to work on this um, myself with the help of a number of people at Acquia, as well as anyone else that wants to get involved. And it's, think of it as an experiment. Um, what I would like to do there is maybe identify the top five or top 10 user improvements, uh, user authoring experience improvements, um, and try and you know, add them on top of Drupal 7, right? With the idea, again, to show all of you and the rest of the world what Drupal 8 or you know, Drupal 7 could look like in, in terms of um, usability for people that enter content. Um, I don't want to make it giant. I just want to make it a relatively small distribution with just showcase, just to showcase a handful or a dozen of really great improvements such that we can hopefully, hopefully people will rally around them and say, actually, this needs to be, um, this needs to be in core. And I think 
it's a different way of doing things. Like, you know, if you look at Drupal 7 and D7 UX, we sort of started out with, here is a screenshot. <laughs> and it was hard to convince people that it would actually make things better. But it did, even though there's still people skeptical. Um, you know, the reason Drupal 7 has grown so fast is because things like overlay, frankly, uh, these kinds of usability things. Um, but one of the things that worked really well, in my mind, was the, um, the vertical taps stuff. Like there was a module for seven, uh, or there was a prototype, and all of a sudden, I felt like people could see the value. They got excited because they could play with it. And so Phoenix, in my mind, is just an experimental playground to play with some of these things and make it easy for people to, to see what we could do, and then, you know, obviously to go to the regular community process as whether we think this makes sense to be included in core or whether this belongs in a contributed module. So um, I hope to be working on this with, um, you know, like three, four people. They'll, they may be working on this full time for a while. Um, and then hopefully uh, people from the community. Um, and I think if we're successful, I think people, people all around may start from Phoenix when they need to build a website that needs to be used by, you know, people that spend several hours a day entering content, just like people would start with um, Pressflow when they needed to build a website that needed to scale, right? So that's a little bit the vision. And again, it's experimental, but uh, I think it could work well. So we have time for maybe, you know, if we go fast, maybe three questions. If not, I'll have to cut it off. Okay, hi, I'm Lucas. Um, I was one of the two people that didn't raise their hand when you asked if I'm a Drupal developer, because uh -huh. in fact I'm a Symfony 2 developer, and I want to just bring a little bit of an outside perspective or how we do things. So we have, as uh, Fabian explained yesterday, we have the components, um, and then we have a full stack framework. And so for components, um, some of them have other developers that are sort of nodding off the pull requests, even though Fabian in the end is the person that merges them. But on the full stack framework, we actually we pull in a lot of third party dependencies like Ascetic for asset management, Monolog for logging, uh, Doctrine for annotations and ORM and all that stuff. And so when we do a release, we have the standard distribution where we basically take the latest stable versions of all of these. It also includes some bundles, uh, which is our lingo for modules. Um, and then we put that together and that's then the next version that we put out. So that's similar, I guess, for the, like the lieutenant with a small core uh, approach. Um, and I think for us that so far has worked well, but mm -hmm. also we are still very young, so we can't say that this is like a mature model that has worked for decades either. Great, thank you. I mean, I think we can always learn from other projects, right? So we should. I'm John O. Schuster, and I was intrigued by an earlier comment about the need for better data about what parts of Drupal are used in, in websites. Uh, I'm willing to put my shoulder to that wheel a bit. If there's anybody who would like to join me in a discussion on that topic, catch me after the meeting. And I assume it's a real need, Dries, so uh, if anybody wants to take that on with me, I'd, I'd be happy to put my shoulder to that wheel. Excellent. Great, thank you. One more question. It's about uh, the initiatives. Uh, mm -hmm. I have some minor comment to, to do. Uh, currently, the initiatives are getting some merges into upstream core, and but I'm asking me myself in if are they really following the way that core is developed? Uh, I mean, uh, there I, I know that initiatives are one of the exploring approaches to help development uh, following the Lintenman uh, model. Uh, which gives more flexibility, but in my opinion, uh, they should also try to follow the Drupal core usual way of development. Uh, that means, for example, uh, they are not really using the issue queue for communication. Uh, uh, for example, the, the, the recently merges uh, from one of the initiatives, uh, th they don't really uh, have the uh, readable log uh, history. So for people that are not really involved in the initiatives, it's pretty hard to actually follow the development of Drupal mm -hmm. if they are not inside the initiatives. If, if I think if it would be great if they can um, if they can rework a little the history before merge, 
uh, because it's pretty hard for people outside the initiative actually to follow the development of all uh, development. Right. I, th I think these are valid points. Um, I think initiatives are new. We've never really done this before. I think in many ways we're still in the sort of formation stage. Um, each of the initiatives are run slightly different. Uh, and I think we're learning what works and what doesn't work. And I feel like people are starting to to standardize a little bit more than maybe in the beginning on, on one approach, which has you know, proven to work. Um, communication is a big issue, which we talk about a lot. Um, you know, we, need to, we, we understand we need to provide better visibility into the progress uh, of each of these initiatives with the goal to get more people in so they can help. So, cool. So, you know, I thought this went great. <laughs> I, you know, I, there was a lot of people asking questions, which, which is awesome. Um, you know, as always, I think, it, I think it's great that we, we spend time talking about these things. And, you know, I wanted to reassure you guys that I'm very much open to discuss these things. And as always, I think um, I'm also open to making changes. Um, I think that's the only way for us to be successful. Um, at the same time, I think, <clears throat> although it may sound like we have big issues in front of us, and we do, <laughs> I think um, we should also re remember that we have made a lot of changes already and that we are doing extremely well, right? So one of the great things about us, you know, core developers is we're always critical. We're always unhappy in a way, right? It's like we released Drupal 7, we have a big party, actually, you know, 350 parties all around the world, and the next day we're grumpy again because <laughs> it, it could have been better, you know? <laughs> and that's, and in many ways, that's great. And we should, we should foster that. At the same time, I think Drupal cons, you know, and, and other events are great opportunities to also recognize all of the success that we have and the fact that we're doing many things right. So if you're in the audience and you're starting to freak out <laughs> because of all of the, the, the issues that we need to solve, you know, take a step back once in a while and, and you know, realize that things are actually going extremely well despite the fact that we all, um, want to make things better as well. So with that, we'd like to say thank you for participating and attending and uh, hope to see you around. Thank you.